May the words that are spoken and may my innermost thoughts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. May they be pleasing to you. For you are my strength, my rock, and my savior. Amen. Today's scripture reading from the Old Testament can uh, be found on page 66 of your Bible if you would like to follow along. Exodus verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 1 through 17. Today I'm reading from the message translation. God spoke all those words. I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery. No other gods, only me. No carved gods of any size, shape, or form of anything whatsoever, whether, whether things that fly or walk or swim. Don't bow down to them and don't serve them because I am God, your God. And I am the most jealous God, punishing the children for any sins that the parents pass on to them, <coughs> to the third and yes, even to the fourth generation of those who hated me. But I am unswervingly loyal to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. No using the name of God, your God, in curses or silly banter. God won't put up with the irreverent use of his name. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Work six days and do everything you need to do. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to God, your God. Don't do any work. Not you, not your son, nor your daughter, nor your servant, nor your maid, nor your animals. Not even the foreign guest visiting in your town. For in six days God made heaven, earth, and the sea, and everything in them. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore God blessed the Sabbath day. He set it apart as a holy day. Honor your father and mother, so that you'll live a long time in the land that God, your God, is giving to you. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lies about your neighbor. No lusting after your neighbor's house, or wife, or servant, or maid, or ox, or donkey. Don't set your heart on anything that is your neighbor's. Our second scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the second chapter, verses 13 through 22. We are in the passion story in John. A very familiar thing, oftentimes called the cleansing of the temple. Listen now for God's word to you. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle and sheep and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the table of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous signs will you show us? Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days, it'll raise, I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remind, remember that he had said, and they believed the scripture, and the words that Jesus spoken. My friends, the word of God is among us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God.
Thank you. Now you might be wondering about the two scriptures this morning. Um, I, I love both of them and I think there is this piece of God's word and these two pieces of scripture that are very personal and very intimate. And they're to be about our lives and how we live our lives. So we have Exodus 20, um, which is law and wisdom coming down from Yahweh. And then we have John 2, which is about the action and the power. Um, and together, I think they talk about life and that ultimate love of God. We've been talking this Lent about the fact that oftentimes we need to create space for God to reside in our hearts. And I will tell you, sometimes I think that means we need to clean out some of the stuff that gets in the way. I don't know if you know, but there's a trend going on in the U.S. housing market right now, albeit a small one. Um, it's drawn um, to the prospect of financial freedom, a simpler life, and limiting one's environment and foot place. Many of the buyers are opting to create spaces of no larger than 300 square feet to live in. There's a TV series called Tiny House Nation. I don't know if anybody's watching it. It caught my eye. And it's celebrating this movement, these folks that are living in these tiny spaces. And of course, you know, they have these people traveling across the country looking at these ingenious small dwellings and their creative inhabitants. The show helps families design and construct their own little mini homes. Um, and I think one of the benefits of this attention that is being placed on the tiny house movement is that it inspires a necessity of dialogue about housing. Questions revolving around need and frivolity. How small? Can you go? Debt, environment and stewardship, happiness and relationships. And, and yes, this means getting rid of a lot of stuff in order to live in one of these spaces. Um, but it's an interesting conversation to have as we talk about what is the appropriate housing size. So we have two pieces of scripture. Our first one is the Exodus 20. It's the law and the wisdom. So here's the scene. We're at Mount Sinai in the middle of that harsh, terrible wilderness when God spoke all those words. And on that long day ago, as narrated for us in Exodus 20, the words and the sounds of words blew the people away. They were, we're told in verse 18, smoke on the mountain, even as the sound of Yahweh's majestic voice shook the roots of the mountains and caused the Israelites a kind of terror they had rarely known before. These people were undone by God having spoken these words. In this day and age, we hear the Ten Commandments, I love to call them God's top ten. And I would suggest we probably aren't undone. Yet, these are the rules, if you will have it, that we're supposed to live by. Words of law and wisdom. And then we go to the second fruits of scripture in John 2, and of course that's our action and power. So Jesus makes room again in the temple for the spiritual business to happen. That hadn't really happened for a while because of the commerce and that flea market type of feel that had taken over. 
So Jim just really literally shakes things up. He makes a whip. He turns over tables. He displays quite a bit of temper. And what do the authorities do? They ask him, well, on whose authority are you here? Who sent you? And Jesus replies in an interesting reply, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. That's a Jesus-like answer, right? He always comes around the question in an interesting way. And, of course, that's a ludicrous claim. That would have been impressive, as all get out. But, really ludicrous. And, of course, then the authorities remind him it took them almost 47 years to actually build that temple. There is absolutely no way that he can do that in three days. And see, typical of John, we get this theological aside when we're informed that the temple in question is actually Jesus' body. And that Jesus is the temple. And I wonder if perhaps, just perhaps, our religious authorities and those around Jesus missed the point because of the clutter. The clutter that was from the temple and the selling, the clutter that happens in our lives. And I wonder if that's what Jesus was really rebelling against. The fact that we oftentimes don't notice because so much clutter is in our world. So, there was an interesting experiment done not too long ago by the Washington Post. I'll set it up for you. It's a busy day at a Washington, D.C. metro station. And a man comes in and opens a violin case and begins to play his fiddle for the passerby.
Some tables, so be it. 